Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Good morning. We are in the second of approximately 300 sermons covering the stories of Luke and Acts. So again, you've made it to, some of you have made it to two out of two. There's only 298 to go, give or take. And so again, I encourage you, don't miss any. Just keep coming back for the next couple years and you'll have the entirety of Luke and Acts figured out more or less. Kristen works in uh, several evenings of the week at the normal public library, which leaves me in the interesting place of acting as pastor dad. And sometimes it's easier for me to live on the pastor side of that continuum than it is the dad side. And so I, I have a couple survival strategies that I will share with any of the prospective fathers, parents in town, in, in church this morning. One of them is in the evening, I always find it advantageous to get my kids out on a walk just to, to help the sort of settling process as bedtime approaches. Getting some of those wiggles out just always seems to work wonders. And so just a couple days ago, I took the kids on a walk. We, we live right on the Constitution Trail, which is lovely, especially during the summer. And so we walked just up the Constitution Trail to a little nature sanctuary that's near our house. And I took the kids down there. All three of them walked the whole way. It's only about maybe a quarter mile or so from our house. And we walked all over the, the nature sanctuary looking for ducks, finding a lot of spiders, a few squirrels, that looked at the trees. I tried to identify them. I've tried to make it a, a little bit of a hobby to start identifying these Illinois trees that I'm not as familiar with as some of the trees that I grew up with in California. And then as we headed home, Ren, our youngest child, he did something that I have grown to love as a parent. He walked up next to me and he sort of clung to my pant leg in a semi-hug and he lifted up his hands with tiny fingers and he said, down, down, down. Ren, and actually I think most of our children in fact, got up and down confused. And Ren, more than any other, I mean, he, anytime he wants up, he will say down. Now he understands what down means at least 50% of the time because when he wants down, he will say also down. It's a very efficient language he's developing. And so there he sat, stood, his those tiny fingers wiggling, crying, down, down. I, there's just something about that image. All three of my children I will always cling to of those tiny fingers le- reaching up to me, wanting up. It's just a, one, of the, one of those images as a parent, for me at least, that just clings to me. We read in the book of Luke a story about a couple that longed for those tiny fingers. Luke chapter 1 verse 5 tells the story when Herod was king of Judea. Now, Herod, for those of you who are interested, and I I, want to just provide a little bit of the additional contextual information as we read our passage this morning. Herod was the king of Judea, named so by his father Antipater on his deathbed, and What happened with Herod was actually kind of interesting. Herod was actually a beloved king for most of his reign by the Jewish people. You don't really get that impression from the gospel stories because his... As his rule came to its end, he was sort of wrapped up, we see this in scripture and it's certainly accounted for in history, with this odd paranoia that sort of took over his life. But Herod was well loved by the Jewish people. He uh, was very lenient toward 
their practices was very much in favor of allowing them to keep the Sabbath as they wanted to keep the Sabbath. In fact, famously, Herod performed an incredible renovation of the temple and, and, and brought it to a place of splendor, lacking the splendor of Solomon's temple that stood in the same place but had then been destroyed. But Herod was a, a great a king of the Jewish people till the end of his life. And we we read this story, Herod being king here, it's near the end of his reign. He died in the in the fourth year BC, just before we get the calendar turnover. We're counting down to zero and we've been counting up from zero ever since. Herod, for some reason, as I mentioned, he has this paranoia. We will see it played out in the stories of Scripture when he hears through sort of the rumors and from visiting dignitaries that another king has been born in Judea. Herod was king of the Judea. There was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah. You know, that order you all are very familiar with. As you're also familiar, there, there were actually 24 priestly orders. You can find that in 1 Chronicles. David, actually, because the high priest's family of the Old Testament, the family of Aaron, over the centuries had grown larger and larger and larger, all of a sudden there became this pressing issue. Who gets to be the high priest? Who gets to have the, the fun job of offering sacrifices, prayers of incense, eating the yummy showbread? Who gets all that glory, that honor? And so David, back in First Chronicles, he separated all of the priests into 24 families. Each priestly order was allowed to serve and assigned to serve in the temple for one week, twice a year. And that's, through the centuries, what a practice that continued on to the days of Jesus. It lasted perhaps a thousand years at this point. And his wife, Elizabeth, was also from the priestly line of Aaron. She was actually a direct descendant of the eldest son of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in the eyes of God, careful to obey all the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children to conceive because Elizabeth was unable to conceive and they were both very old. One day, Zechariah was serving God in the temple for his order was on duty that week. Again, this is what Luke is describing here, the author of the Gospel Luke. The order of Abijah was on duty for that week. And as was the custom of the priests, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. It was really interesting. If you go back in First Chronicles, I believe, chapter 24, the way that the order of the priests and, and what weeks that they would serve was selected by lot. David cast lots. The priests were given their order of service that continued all the way down to this point, a thousand years later. And the priests took up that same practice as those families obviously grew over the thousand years to determine what member of the family got to go in the morning and the evening and offer incense on the altar of incense in the temple. And so by lot, it says, Zechariah was chosen to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. While the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. So, maybe to give you a, a little bit of a, a visual picture of, of what Luke is describing, I, I brought a couple pictures. So, what you see here is the temple grounds of Herod's temple. And when it says that the people were outside praying, what that likely means as it, is that this was perhaps the Sabbath. 
every day they offered the incense, but that, that there was a great crowd collected means that this likely happened on the Sabbath. And that crowd would have been separated. I'm going to come to the screen for a second. So, they would be in the outer courts. That's in this area the women's court and the men's court, watching this priest's court, this is where the the, the sacrifices were altered, where this is what they were watching, and this building is the temple itself, within which is the holy place. I'll show you that here in a second. This was Herod's temple. And so, every day, a priest was selected by lot. This day just happened to be Zechariah to go up these steps and into this place that only the priests ever went. And in there, you can maybe see it distantly on this picture, there were three objects. Wonderful. There were three objects. There was the there was the table of showbread. There was a candelabra with seven sort of cups, candles burning. And there was an altar of incense. And so every day, that altar, in the morning and the evening, a priest would go in and would burn incense to the Lord. It was was both symbolic and in a real sense, the the time when Israel, or the Jewish nation at this point, brought their prayers to God. Because the most holy place, which was behind a curtain was the throne room of God on the earth. And so, when Zechariah enters the most holy place, he's he's offering prayers to the Lord. We're back in business. He's offering prayers to the Lord on this altar of incense. And then all of a sudden, to the right of the altar, an angel appears. While Zechariah Zechariah was in the sanctuary, I'm just going to invite you to follow along in your Bibles just to be safe since we are having ghosts in the system, so to speak, that are tearing down the PowerPoint. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, they're offering the prayers of the nation at the altar of incense. An angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the incense altar. Now, there are kind of different opinions. Some people think that that the angel, we find out his identity in a few verses, perhaps just appeared. Other people think that the angel may have come through the curtain from the most holy place, the, the, the throne room of God. In any case, whether he appeared or came through the curtain, Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. And you can only imagine what it would be like to have a figure appear suddenly before you or have a figure come through that curtain, the veil, where there was not supposed to be anybody except for one single day every year to suddenly arrive. The angel said, But don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. Now, one of the things that always catches my interest is every time an angel seems to appear, their first words are almost always, Don't be afraid. And I always wondered growing up why that would be, because usually we think of angels as something like, this. Who could be afraid of such a, a wonderful thing? I mean, they, they show up. Can you imagine the image in your mind of this showing up and Zechariah being struck with fear? Don't be afraid. But I think the reason, even though this has been the popularized image of angels, is because the way that the Bible actually describes angels is quite different. The Bible actually describes angels more like this. They, they have wings and the body of beasts with the heads of people, sometimes different multiple heads of beasts and humans. And I mean, I suppose put yourself in Zechariah's place. You are in a position, one that he has never been in before, because the tradition was that only 
Once in a lifetime could a priest actually enter the holy place and offer the incense. He's never been before. He'll never be again. He is expressly supposed to be by himself. And now all of a sudden, this pops up before you. The fear starts to make more sense, doesn't it? Don't be afraid, the angel says. He continues, You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. Oh, I was going to mention to you, just again, how hopefully adding some context to the story, John, the name that the angel says they need, they need to name this child, means that Yahweh delivers. And Zechariah means Yahweh remembers. So it's, it, there is a, a kind of a synergy there. There is almost a, a communication from God by just the na- very names of the characters in our story. You will have great joy and gladness, the angel continues. And many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. And he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. Now, for, for some of you, the, the story of John the Baptist might sound familiar may sound familiar because it very much sort of parallels this, both the stories of Samson and the stories of Samuel in the Old Testament. In both cases, that you have parents who are longing for children. An angel arrives to tell them. In one case, the angel. Angel is just actually, in the Bible, it, the word doesn't mean sort of an angelic being, but actually it just means messenger. An angel arrives to tell them. In one case, an angel itself, and in another case, a priest, that indeed God will give them a child. And in both the case of Samson, and in the case of Samuel, and now in the case of John, there are some special uh, uh, special circumstances that they are being asked to stick to around the child's sort of diet and makeup. And actually, what we find is that this wasn't sort of willy-nilly. It was actually part of the one of the very much described in the Torah ways that God said that someone could honor Him in a special way. It was called the Nazarite vow. You can read about it in the book of Numbers. In Numbers chapter 6, in Numbers chapter 6, someday this PowerPoint will come together. If any of the people, either men or women, you can follow along. There we go. Take the special vow of, the, of a Nazarite, setting themselves apart to the Lord in a special way. They must give up wine and other alcoholic drinks. They must not use vinegar made from wine or from other alcoholic drinks. They must not drink fresh grape juice and they must not eat grapes or raisins. As long as they are bound by their Nazarite vow, they are not allowed to eat or drink anything that comes from the grapevine. Not even grape seeds or skins. So, John is actually from birth, he is placed and and required by by this message to perform and live this vow of the Nazarite, a special dedication to the Lord. Alright, we're going to try something different here, because this is bringing challenge here. Verse 17 continues, He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. Now we're talking. All right. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and He will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. 
Zechariah said to the angel, How can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man now, and my wife is also well along in years. Then the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was He who sent me to bring you this good news. Now, I want to give you a a quick quiz. Who can tell me what the very last book in the Old Testament is? Malachi. Malachi, absolutely. And, And who can tell me what the very last passage in the Old Testament is? Malachi chapter 4 verses 5 and 6 the very last piece of scripture in the Old Testament the last scripture in fact that precedes Luke's writing in the gospel here Malachi 4 5 and 6 look I am sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. His preaching will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. So, in effect, the angel is saying, the very last prophecy that was made by a prophet in this land is now coming to fruition. The words of the prophet Malachi, which at this point were perhaps 400 years old, today, this time, this child, this is it. And I often wonder as I read that passage, how cognizant Zechariah was of of the significance of what was being foretold to him by Gabriel. Did he realize in that moment, this is... This, right here, is what Malachi was talking about. Was he too sort of struck by fear that it was not until later during the pregnancy of his wife that he put the pieces together? Was it perhaps, as we will read in the coming weeks, the moment that his lips are reopened, that he understood by the Holy Spirit what was happening? I don't know. The story, though, continues. Gabriel seemingly irked by Zechariah's uh, lack of assurance in his words. You would think, I suppose, that if an angel appears miraculously in the middle of the temple and tells you what's going to happen in your life, you might be willing to just take them at their word. But Zechariah, it seems, wasn't quite there. But now, since you didn't believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. Now, I will say, though, that Zechariah actually asked for it. Right? Because he says, how can I be sure this will happen? He's asking for a sign, isn't he? We talked this morning in Sabbath school about the law of unintended consequences. Gabriel gives him some assurance. His response maybe wasn't what Zechariah was expecting, though. He's struck, unable to speak. There's your sign. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah to come out of the sanctuary, wondering why he was taking so long. When he finally did come out, he couldn't speak to them. Then they realized from his gestures and his silence that he must have seen a vision in the sanctuary. When Zechariah's week of service in the temple was over, he returned home. Soon afterward, his wife, Elizabeth, became pregnant and went into seclusion for five year, months. <laughs> That'd be a long pregnancy. How kind the Lord is, she exclaimed. He has taken away my disgrace of having no children. We have here an interesting story because on, on one hand, this is a story almost simply about God answering prayer. Right? The angel says, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son and you are to name him John. You know, it is, in many ways, that is what this story is all about. It's, it's that God answers prayer. Here, Zechariah and Elizabeth have been praying. Scriptures tells us that they are old. They've been praying for a child. 
And now the Lord is answering their prayer. Perhaps not in the time they expected, but indeed the angel Gabriel gives them that assurance. And what I want us to really appreciate though is is the significance of what is happening. Because Scripture actually says that that Zechariah was old. And likely what that means is that he was past the age that a priest was supposed to serve in the temple. Scripture says that there was a, a very defined period of service for a priest that ended when you were 50. After which time your son would take your place as a priest for your uh, wing of the family. But Zechariah is here. He's old. He is past the time of his duty and he is serving only because he has never been had the child that was supposed to step into his place. So imagine his joy when the lot that has never before fallen on him falls on him when he is far past, perhaps, his time of service. What a, what a unique gift he received in that moment. Never in his regular service was he, did he have the opportunity to go into the holy place and offer up the incense. But now God, in His old age, past the time of service, when His Son is supposed to have taken His place, He gets to go into the altar of incense. And what does Zechariah ask for there? A son. Fulfilling the very duties that His Son was supposed to be fulfilling in His place. God gives him the opportunity to go to the altar of incense where these prayers rise before the throne of God. And that's the place that finally, after long years of desperate, faithful prayer, God answers. God answers prayers. That that is a simple but powerful concept, isn't it? And we learn from this story that, that a couple things are true. First is... God's timing is not always our timing. Certainly at some point, Zechariah and Elizabeth, as the the years drifted by, should have realized, you know what, God, this is just, I suppose, not a prayer that you're answering. And yet in their old age, so old that Zechariah is stunned that they could even have a child at such an advanced age. Yet they were still faithful enough to pray. God was faithful. He answered in His time. And what they perhaps never considered over that long period of years, who knows how many decades, 20, 30, 40 years, was that God was not only going to answer their prayer, but He was going to answer their prayers in a way that they had never conceived of before. Luke describes the child that Gabriel is foretelling in in such an incredible way. I mean, imagine as you were anticipating a child that you have an angel tell you he's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit since before birth. That sounds grand. I would love to have that promise as a parent that my child would be filled with the Holy Spirit from before birth. I mean, what a, what a, what a way of, of assurance that my child was going to be near to the Lord. He continues, and he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. Boy, how exciting that would be. Man, not only is he going to be faithful, but he's going to draw other people to faithfulness. Remember, these are priests, Zechariah and Elizabeth. They fulfill the role in society of drawing people to the Lord. And so now, not only do they get assurance that their son will be near to the Lord, but that he will fulfill the duty of their family to draw people, lead people to faithfulness to the Lord their God. I mean, the the news just gets better and better. He will be a man with the spirit and the power of Elijah. Hold the phone. Stop the presses. Now we've moved from like 
All right, my son's going to be a he's going to be a follower of God. That's great. Man, what a wonderful blessing. All right, my son is going to be a faithful witness. He's going to draw other people. Wow, that's fantastic. Now all of a sudden we're moving from like good news to historical precedents. That would be like me receiving word from God that my son is going to be a basketball player after the fashion of Michael Jordan. <laughs> Hot dog, I'm going to stop putting stuff away for retirement. I mean, this is, this is what's happening, right? I wonder, Zechariah, wow, well, this is great. Maybe, maybe we'll have ravens delivering us food in our retirement. This is going to be wonderful. I mean, Elijah is like... He's the superhero of superheroes for this people. And now, after years of praying for a child, the the child that they are receiving is blowing their minds. But then the clincher. He will prepare the Lord for the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. Now all of a sudden, we're not just in historical precedence. We're not just talking about a legend of the people. We're talking about the anticipation of all of Scripture coming to fruition in my lifetime through this child. Yes, does God answer prayers in His time? Absolutely. But when God answers prayers, He does not withhold blessing. He does not do things by half measures. In this moment, Zechariah and Elizabeth move from just crushing defeat at not having a child to now, as Elizabeth says, how kind the Lord is. He's taken away my disgrace. Yeah, there is something else happening in this story though and what is really intriguing to me is how both the, the simple but profound reality that God answers prayers meets the other element of this story we, we find out that, that though God has heard their prayers there is something else going on. We just read about it. That this child is, is the one that was prophesied in Malachi. That this child is preparing the way of the Lord. And, and that is where this story becomes interesting. There is a dichotomy to it. Because, well, God is answering the prayers of Zechariah Zechariah and and Elizabeth. God is also accomplishing His plan. God is also fulfilling a promise that in many ways has nothing to do with the prayers of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Because God made those promises, both that of the coming of the Messiah and of Elijah returning to lead God's people back together far, far, far before Zechariah and Elizabeth found themselves childless and began to pray. So this is also a story of God fulfilling His plans, fulfilling His promises. And it makes me sort of wonder, All right, well, what's the chicken and what's the egg here? At what point did God's plan to bring a prophet after the the nature of Elijah into the world, at what point did that mesh with the prayers of this faithful elderly couple for a child? Was that God's plan all along when He he gave Malachi this this vision, this insight? Did He know at that moment, it's going to be so awesome. This is going to be this wonderful elderly couple that are going to be serving me for for their entire lives, desperate for a child. Did God have this plan all along? And, And it was only as He received the prayers of Zechariah and Elizabeth that He said, you know what, this is going to be great. These are exactly the people I want to give this child to. What what came first? The plans of God or the prayers? Zechariah and Elizabeth. Because both are taking place in this story. 
There is a there's an individual reality for the couple. But there is also a, a, a global, historical value for all of the nation of Israel, all the, the Jews on us today. And what I find fascinating is this idea that in some way God took the prayers of Zechariah and Elizabeth and He drew them into His plan. That some way this innocent, longing prayer became part of a story of God's plan for humanity. God's plan for salvation. I can guarantee you that at no point any day when Zechariah and Elizabeth were on their knees, even when Zechariah was before the altar of incense, was he asking God, God, give me a son that will make the way for the Savior, the Messiah. Give me a son that's going to be like Elijah. That was... He was just asking for a child. And yet that simple prayer, God drew it into this incredible, powerful story that changed the course of not only people's lives, but history. You see, our prayers... Our prayer is the means by which God the Father lifts us up into His plans. Our prayers, in effect, are our tiny fingers reaching up to the Father, crying up, up, up. And and it is by our prayers that God grasps us and draws us into His plan. That's remarkable. I mean, Zechariah and Elizabeth are, are immortalized in Scripture for the simple act of asking God for a child. And it suggests something profound to us about our prayers. It challenges us in concern in regard to our prayers. Because if my prayers are a means by which God can draw me into His plan, then I boy, I have a responsibility in some ways. I have a, a call in many ways to pray boldly. If at some point in their lives Zechariah and Elizabeth said, you know what, honey? I, I don't think I'm even capable of having a child at this point. You know? What's the... What's the bother? Boy, what is the story like? Surely God's promises are fulfilled, but does Zechariah and Elizabeth have anything to do with it? But because their boldness in praying powerful, bold prayers, they are drawn by the Lord into the sweep of His plan. And so, how ought we to pray? We need to pray boldly. If we are satisfied with simply asking the Lord to bless our food, give us good night sleeps, and make sure that we get from A to B safely, how then will the Lord take those prayers and bring them into His plan? Surely He can. But how much more so if we boldly ask the Lord for children? If we boldly ask the Lord to make disciples, if we boldly ask the Lord to change this city, if we boldly ask the Lord to change this country, to change this world, if we are bold enough to pray, the Lord is is faithful to grasp those tiny reaching fingers of prayer and draw us into the sweep of His plans for this world. So let us take that incredible opportunity with a gusto. Pray boldly that we might have the opportunity not just to have our prayers answered, but to be a part of God's plan of salvation for this world. Let's pray together. Lord, 
We thank You for the story of this faithful, bold couple who were not satisfied to ever stop asking You for a child. Lord, give us the same boldness as we pray for our children, as we pray for our church and our city, as we pray for those that need to know Your love. Lord, let us not quibble and be satisfied with simple prayers, but Lord, prayers that will be swept up by Your mercy and love into the plan You have. In Jesus' name, Amen.